Hello to the Chicos and the Chicas. How are you going? Lovely folks. Today is the time for my students rock and in fact now the plural is particularly fitting because I'm going to deliver to you two games played by two different students and to make this edition of my students rock even more unique than usual probably for the first time I'm going to actually deliver to you um, a game that my student lost and you might wonder why on earth would I do that to my student but you are going to understand it very very soon so um, in the white trunk is our opponent, uh, the opponent, whereas in the black trunks is the student. And what you really need to know about this game before uh, I even get into the game itself is that here we are playing against an opponent 700 rating points higher than us. On over the board rating, that is. This is an over the board game, proper uh, time controller, I think it was 60-10 or something along the lines of that, so not quite okay. proper, but uh, close enough, Ben Shush. Um, um, and uh, no, no, it's not that Ben, it's a different Ben, I was uh, watching a StarCraft stream um, whilst I was getting gathering my thoughts. So, let's jump into it, d4, d5, bishop f4, so we have the London, uh, as you would expect from a club level encounter to pop up rather often. And um, student goes a little bit, hmm, with bishop g4, knight f6 is our uh, theory that we like to play. But overall, you have to say that uh, the opening has gone splendidly well from black's point of view. I mean, against the London, you really have to, um, I don't know, throw pieces away on purpose in order to get into any kind of trouble. So that's not necessarily a big call, but still. Um, it is quite decent and the first big issue that I had with this game here was C takes D4. We have thoroughly discussed this moment with student that this is the classic case of releasing tension in the center, giving up a side central pawn for a non-central one. So just the actual typical no-go ever capture unless we have got uh, some benefits coming from it which we certainly don't and again just because I like to make it an educational point when you go like, okay, but what then instead? Play the move you would play after take take, which in his case was bishop d6. So that's what we should have done here. Yeah, but what if they take? That's when they make your mistake. They give up the center. So now these two pawns are one in the center, one ready to join, whereas white has no pawns in the center. Anyway, that was just to plug my center course. Um, c3, take, take, bishop d6, knight e5, take on e5, pawn takes, bishop e2, queen e2, knight e7. Now, 12 moves have gone, and our position is totally fine. I'm very, very happy, because usually we used to spend a lot of time uh, in the opening, especially when we were on um, unknown territory, and here it seems to me that we manage the situation really well. Opponent plays queen g4, a very logical move to target the g7 pawn. And here again, um, this student is one that usually struggles with uh, the concept of when something is hanging, you have other options rather than defending it. We actually put that concept to the use and we take on e5. The slight issue here is that, um, interestingly enough, the other capture was even better with the idea that after check king moves here, we have queen f6. And now you understand why the knight switch needed to happen. If it were this knight here, then now I wouldn't have queen f6. But uh, nothing major here either. After knight takes e5, queen takes g7, we have knight g6, and we are holding the position beautifully, absolutely together. Lovely stuff. Opponent goes knight f3, queen e7. Now we are floating various kind of uh, plans to trade queens, which is quite necessary because our structure is a little bit loose. Um, and um, yeah, the only thing that really breaks my heart about this game is, is that as per usual, finding these IDs took the student way too long. Bishop g5, queen f8, the queens come off. And here actually we made a mistake that I want to reflect on very quickly. So we took with the king, which is a typical case of hope chess. Because what this move is telling me is that black is hoping to play king g7 and then play f6. Which, if was allowed, would be the very best thing we could do. 
except it's not gonna be allowed. The opponent is gonna shut us down with bishop f6 when these guys are all looking a little bit funny. So instead, the uh, correct capture would have been rook takes with the very same idea of f6, e5, king up, king up, where I actually would prefer to be black. Because although the pawn uh, island theory suggests that white is better, having two pawn islands versus three, but if you consider how mobile, and now I'm playing a few doozies, uh, not so great moves for white on purpose to model this. So if you consider how much space these pawns control in the middle of the board, um, it's obviously quite amazingly a great position for black. So we took with king, slight mistake there. So now we have to juggle some pieces around to kick the bishop out. And we did that too. Absolutely awesome play. I'm immensely proud of my student here. 1100 fide over the board. Not only holding his own against um, an 1800 fide, but actually getting the better of them too. Look at this. Takes, takes, king d6. Perfect. Perfect endgame technique. Rook h4, h6, rook h5. Makes absolutely no sense. Buries the rook alive on h5 where it doesn't really have too much to do. And now White is facing various pawn push ideas. Unfortunately, by now, my student is literally playing on increment, which is, I think, 10 seconds. Um, and uh, we make a mistake, which turns out to be a pretty good move. B5, B4 is still very good. Rook C4 is also very good. And due to the fact that our pawn structure is a lot more mobile and because of our king is a lot more active than theirs, um, black is doing better here. D4, a very curious blunder because after rook d3, rook c4, it actually turns out that um, taking this is not even good because after takes, takes king here. Um, actually, hang on, that is good. What happened here? Wait, take, take, take. Did you miss something here with king d5, rook h4? Yes. So here, actually, we did blunder. My bad. I thought that there was one blunder in the game. So yeah, yeah, yeah. Rook c4 was the way to go, and then d4, and then king d5, or b5, b4 even. So this was actually a blunder, which is going to make my uh, point even better towards the end. Rook d3, rook c4, rook take, and then they don't take. That's insane. They played king d2, perhaps mutual time trouble. I don't know. King up. Now all fine and dandy. Take, take, take. Check back king c3 e5 and again we are playing beautifully this rook ending rook f6 admitted that the rook is a little bit annoying now but the difference between the kings is still uh, a great trump in black's hand and white blunders this time with g4 allowing us to take take and go check a beautiful in-between move before we pick off the cherry on f2 and now white actually has to fight for life by king c3 and hoping for the best. Instead, they go king d3. Hello. And after rook b2, rook e5, the most tragic things happen that you could possibly imagine happening in this position. We lost on time. Which is well and truly heartbreaking because both king d6 and king b4 uh, are winning for black actually, which is hardly surprising because upon the falling of the a2 pawn We have got the two connected pass pawns, which is the god of rook endings two connected passers So that was it man. That was 700 rating points difference and the worst we ever stood in the game is One point here where we blundered this pawn which the opponent failed to exploit and then they blundered it back literally five moves later here and what really hurt me about this game was that after the game, the opponent said to my student that they were winning throughout the whole game. The nerve of the London player throughout the whole game. Like, where, bro? You came out of the opening with absolute nothing. Absolute nothing. Then we went into an end game, which is dead even. Especially after rook takes. Like, no problems. And then he carried on to go into a, a clearly slightly inferior rook ending where black has all the shots with uh, b5, b4, rook c4, d4 and so on. 
So that was a little bit disrespectful to say the least, but you know, whatever. I have to say that I'm immensely proud of my student for this game. I mean, 700 rating points. Imagine that that would be, I don't know, like, I, I, I can't even think about an analogy here because if my most recent rating, if I had 700 to that, there is no human with that rating. Not that my rating is that high, but still. So it's like Magnus Carlsen playing a 2100. I mean, imagine the chances of them surviving. In fact, having the upper hand for the majority of the game. So kudos to student. It was an awesome effort. And it uh, is actually a great way to encourage people to be brave when it comes to playing up. You're going to learn a lot more when you play up. You have a far less to lose. And likely the quality of the games will be higher too. Now, in order to finish on a positive note though, I wanted to chuck in a victory. So I'm throwing in another game from another student who is uh, playing around 2100 uh, leeches strength as black. He plays the London. Oh, foo -foo, no, I'm kidding. The Nimzo as black. Uh, was that even a Freudian slip? That was the anti-Freudian slip. Bishop b4, bishop d2, d5, queen a4, check. Not your typical move. Knight c6, e3. It's already looking like white is playing a very, very dodgy Nimzo Indian, not having too much clue what to do. By the way, also 2100. And after castles, they go back to queen c2. And this is where what's happening next uh, is going to be really really awesome uh i have no idea why i left those things on the screen as long as now but whatever i removed them now um and that is that the game has gone out of the normal path and when that happens you need to respond to that it's not okay for you to play an opening where at one point your opponent does a really weird stuff and you don't go like hold on a tick that's not okay there let me see. That has to be a reaction every time, all the time. Because otherwise it means that we are not part of the equation, right? So if you are driving to work every single day in traffic and one day, instead of a massive lines of car, there is a Boeing 747 right in front of you on the road and you don't go like, wait a tick, that's unusual compared to what it usually is that means that you're not driving properly you are not aware of what's going on and you have to answer you have to respond to the newly created circumstances and that's the same in chess so as soon as your opponent does fishy stuff you stop and you go like that's not normal and usually best case scenario or your response is going to be a how i punish it of course, by playing in the center like my students would. And play e5, legendario, immediately seeking conflict because black is ready for conflict. I mean, look at the beautiful development castle king versus this cluster disaster. Awesome chess. Takes, knight takes, bishop c4, double question mark from the computer who is not as gentle as I am. Now, to be fair, knight b6 wins the house because bishop is on, pawn is on. But I just can't really blame student for bishop e6 although it does get a question mark from the engine i mean morphe would rejoice uh because of the complete development but also this was a cheap trick well not actually sorry nah it is that it's a developing move that carries a trick and as such it's fu fully valid even if it's not as good as knight b6 and the opponent of course falls for the trick the da knight takes e3 and this is how you win chess games as black in 10 moves when your opponent is playing uh openings coming from weird's wheel takes takes and white is essentially lost and that's the mentality that you need to acquire and follow in order to take certain steps up on the ladder uh when you are playing and and that's basically the fastest way uh, to move up that any time your opponent does something dodgy you question it bishop takes d5 bishop takes e2 uh, probably not necessary i don't see why we couldn't just take this guy here but again we had plans and that plan was to go into this opposite color bishop scenario which is going to be a beautiful opportunity for me to plug um our second course that i'm making with uh 
legendary chess grandmaster, greatest female player of all time, Judith Polka. In the second course, which is not out yet, but will be released not very far down the track, we'll have a very large chunk in it in which we discuss opposite colored bishop scenarios, not only in end games, but in middle games too. A lot of people don't necessarily understand um, the secrets of uh, opposite colored bishop middle games. And so this was a golden opportunity for me to draw uh, attract awareness to that. Queen g4, f5, we're really going for it, but queen d5 again would have been a lovely move to um, showcase how versatile this queen is attacking this way, attacking that way, declining or rather denying castles that way, attacking here, defending here. That's an absolute boss. f5 on the other hand is also in the aggro. Now we play queen d5, queen g3, f4 baby, opening up the position in front of the king. Carnage is inevitable. They took and they got quickly mated. Awesome effort by another student. So this is, guys, this week's My Students Rock. I hope that we managed to take a little bit away from it. Although this is predominantly just an opportunity for me to give something back to my students who do a lot of very hard work and they cop a lot of grief from me for all of their mistakes but um, our goal together is always to make us a better chess player than what we were yesterday so i suppose this is what it is thank you very much for watching i will be back with more soon bye